Their corporate purposes lie somewhere else, usually providing solutions to other contemporary problems ac across the globe. Often disputes are obstacles to the achievement of such goals and should be properly addressed and overcome. As lawyers, disputes are part of our business and our job is to help people and companies resolve and prevent disputes in order to enable their own purposes. We strongly believe that. And this is why MAMG is so committed to embark on this new journey with CPR. Now, as for the structure of this webinar, Alan will start with a general overview on CPR's toolkit for dispute prevention. And then we will ask questions to each speaker and invite comments from the others. Please feel free to ask questions directly mm -hmm. using the Q&A function. That's all for me, Alan. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rafael, and greetings to everybody. Uh, I, I want to start by thanking Rafael and his colleagues at MAMG Avogados, whose leadership and inspiration, and I think you just saw an example of that in the wisdom that Rafael shared, has really been a driving force as we have turned our focus to the area of dispute prevention. The same is true of the other panelists who are fortunate to have joined us today. Let me just reflect for a moment as Raphael shared with you his experiences as an outside advocate, sometimes wondering whether a dispute was the best way to approach a conflict. I too had those same realizations that were only heightened when I moved from being an advocate as an outside lawyer into becoming an inside counsel and began to realize that litigation or even arbitrations weren't always the best way to resolve disputes, that there really had to be a better way so he could get back to the purpose that our company sought to serve. At that time, I was at Pfizer and we really wanted to help increase health in the world, not increase disputes. I found my way to CPR really consistent with the search for that mission and was drawn by the focus at CPR, not just on finding better and more efficient students when they arise, but to try to identify mechanisms to help us avoid those disputes altogether. We're not gonna avoid conflicts. Business relationships are like all relationships. There are conflicts that are always going to, sometimes those conflicts can even be productive in driving growth and transformation. But there are actually steps we can take, mm -hmm. and that's the work we've been trying to do at CPR, and with the help of those folks on this panel and others on the task force in identifying those mechanisms. Let me just spend a moment uh, talking about the dispute management continuum, and then focusing in on what we refer to as dispute prevention as our task force actually spent some time trying to define what do we mean prevention. So the dispute management continuum may begin when you form that business re relationship or arrangement, negotiate a contract or other arrangement, put provisions in place or other mechanisms in place, and then conflicts can arise, as I mentioned, in the course of that relationship. The question is, at that moment in time, can we identify the conflict early on and take steps to mitigate it before we may have to turn to trying to address a dispute through even early mediation, negotiations, arbitration, mm -hmm. and litigation? So we refer refer to the definition of dispute planning, monitoring, and or intervention necessary to stabilize a business relationship when in converged and burdens and you that maximum business relationship. Dispute prevention precedes dispute resolution in the dispute management continuum. It concentrates addressing 
conflicts in business relationships amongst the parties in real time, their objectives, mm -hmm. and the solutions necessary to meet those objectives. In contrast, dispute, prevent, dispute resolution focuses on a legal dispute and questions of fault, liability, or exposure, and how to resolve those questions. We at CPR, in furtherance of our work in this area, launched a pledge with the help of all these folks earlier this year, the Dispute Prevention Pledge for Business Relationships that asks parties, and those parties can be uh, companies, law firms, not-for-profits such as CPR, neutral organizations, anybody who enters into business relationships to really proclaim that they are open to exploring mechanisms in their business relationships that will allow for the prevention of conflicts turning into disputes. We've had any number of companies and some law firms such as MAMG sign on to our dispute prevention pledge and we look forward to others doing so. Rafael mentioned there are a number of benefits for dispute prevention, including allowing to maintain our business purpose, our business continuity, to really further cooperative working relationships and to achieve cost savings. The mechanisms that we've been working on with our task force include mechanisms internal to a party, trainings that can be done, driving a culture within our entities for trying to focus on dispute prevention. They could be joint best practices between parties, such as putting in place alliance managers, such as forming relationships and building trust with each other. They can be contractual provisions, such as partnering provisions or escalation provisions that are put into contracts. And they can be the reliance on third parties, such as third party neutrals, and you'll be hearing a number of examples of these as we turn the lists. We at CPR are committed to this, not just in terms of its thought leadership, but we've actually put in place actions that parties can adopt into their arrangements to allow for these mechanisms to be uh, triggered at times when conflicts arise. We've built out a dispute prevention of experts who can help parties bridge gaps when those conflicts arise. And we're otherwise trying to take steps in furtherance of dispute prevention through actual services that we put in place. So there's a lot of great work to do. We invite all of you, our audience, to join us in that work. And let me turn uh, to our panelists now to talk further about the work they have done and we are doing in the community. So first, I'm gonna to turn to Howard Karsman, who is a true leader in this area, not just in terms of his thought leadership, but in the work he has actually been doing over the last seven years at Intel. Mm -hmm. Howard, could you share with us your experience in dispute prevention at Intel and identify some of the guiding principles of Intel's program Absolutely. that you have uh, put in place applicated at other industries. But and good morning to uh, to everyone and and uh, Raphael, thank you for the invitation to join you all this morning. So I am uh, the global construction claims manager for Intel Corporation. It's a position I've held. As Alan mentioned, we're, I'm coming up on seven years, or will be seven years next March, in theory. Um, <clears throat> uh, before that, I was a practicing lawyer. I practiced uh, for about 35 years as a construction lawyer, primarily. I was a neutral arbitrator, mediator, and all, uh, special master for complex litigation in state courts. <laughs> Um, all right. Uh, so, um, <laughs> sounds like we have a participant who, yes. uh, 
<laughs> yes, it's having a family gathering. One. <laughs> yes. Uh, so in this position, uh, the global construction claims manager position is responsible for uh, advising and managing um, uh, Intel and its construction enterprise on the resolution of construction disputes. Intel has a very large capital program. Um, ENR Magazine ranked us as uh, number six internationally among owners, among companies in the size and breadth of its capital program. Uh, in 2016, so I was hired in 2015. In 2016, I was given permission uh, by the director of procurement, and that's the business unit that I sit in. I do not, I'm not a member of Intel Legal. Uh, I was given permission to design and then deploy a dispute management program for large project construction. Alan did an excellent job of defining a dispute management program. It is a program that is intended to at first prevent disputes. And if a dispute is not prevented or preventable, then resolve it at the earliest possible time during the project, not after, and not, frankly, not involving counsel. Uh, the, 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 re, the prevention of disputes and the resolution of disputes is all done at the project level by project people from the major project participants. Uh, so this is a program that we first deployed in 2016 on major projects in the state of Oregon and shortly thereafter in the state of Arizona. Those are the two domestic locations here in the United States states of our mo most sophisticated uh, manufacturing facilities. In 2018, uh, we deployed it in Ireland, which is one of our two major overseas locations for our, um, our fabrication plants. Uh, by the end of 2020, combining all three locations, we had executed probably about $12 billion worth of construction activity uh, with five different prime contractors at those locations. By the end of 2021, we will probably have done somewhere between 15 and $18 billion worth of construction activity. And within this number of, uh, you know, within that number are nested many, many projects at these three locations. And they range from refitting uh, existing facilities to the construction of, of a new fabrication plant. And, and when we're talking about the construction of a new fab, as we call them, you're talking about a $3 billion construction project uh, constructed over a rather short, aggressive time frame. So the net result of this program is that in, since deployed in 2016, with one exception, all issues, disputes, claims were resolved at the project level uh, during the course of the projects. And Intel, again, subject to one small exception, did not pick up the phone to call for the assistance or guidance or advice of outside counsel. So uh, in the construction world, those of us who've been around this world, when we look at just the raw numbers of that volume of construction activity completed, and with one exception, nothing getting into the hands of lawyers, we view that as a tremendous success. It's a success, <laughs> you laugh, there's, it's humorous, but it's true because Construction disputes, like any dispute in an ongoing relationship, and that is the nature of construction. Construction is a complex web of business relationships, all having a common goal of successfully completing a project, and yet every one of them, and you can have 60 or 70 or 80 separate business organizations involved in a major project. Each one of those has a separate agenda but the goal is to somehow get them all pointed in the same direction and achieve a successful outcome. And as is true in any human endeavor, 
disagreements between people are bound to arise. It is the nature of human behavior and construction fundamentally is a human endeavor. So um, the way we've done this, we, we, we employ a standing neutral. There is nothing, we didn't invent the concept of a standing neutral for construction projects. That has been around for a long time. It has taken the, the form of dispute review boards, which have been around for years. What we did differently with our program is we actually went to a very ancient, ancient concept and that of the village elder. I joke about this because it's not, you know, nowadays ageism comes in and I shouldn't even say it that way, but I do. Because if you look at the notion of a village elder, what is a village elder? A village elder is someone who due to their experience, their, their knowledge acquired, their, their wisdom, if you will, they are sought after by members of that community for advice, for wisdom, for guidance. They're a mentor, they're a coach. And then when members of the community have a disagreement, they come to the village elder for assistance in resolving that dispute. And if the gentle guidance uh, and, and facilitation and mediation, if you will, of that elder is unsuccessful, they submit that dispute to the village elder for determination, for a decision. And then they move on because that's what is in the best interest of the community. Well, the same very principles apply to a construction, a major construction project. So our village elder, we call them a third party neutral, which in the world of Intel, everything has an acronym. And our acronym is a TPN, third party neutral. And these people are first and foremost subject matter experts. They have many years of major project construction experience. And that is what gives them the basis upon which to develop the trust among the senior management representatives from the primary contracting parties, owner, constructor, and designer. And so, and, and I'll, I'll close with this within this program, and this program is embodied in a contract provision in our major projects contracts, the concurrent claims resolution section of our contracts. We, are, we give these TPNs a variety of processes to use for primarily for dispute, early dispute resolution. The dispute prevention part is really embedded in their role as that coach, teacher and mentor, where they focus on two primary issues. One, construction risk management. What are the risks that they foresee or are seeing for this particular project? And they bring a particularly unique vision to it because it's a project first vision. Every organization that's in a project sees construction risk from their own lens. But the TPN sees it for the project as a whole. Number two, they focus on the health of the relationships on the project. And when they're meeting with the senior executives, they have already sat in on various project meetings on their monthly visits to the project. They get a very good sense of how people are working together and solving problems together from the different organizations. So they bring all that wisdom with that twin focus and they present it to the senior executives. That's where the dispute prevention uh, takes its form. And then because as Alan noted, dispute prevention and dispute resolution are on a continuum. If something isn't prevented and it actually comes to life and that happens on projects, then the standing neutral, the TPN can employ a variety of processes to resolve and it has been uniformly successful. And that is enough for me, thank you. Thank you, Howard, for you know, this uh, account on your own experience and Intel's experience in this fantastic program. Let me just ask the other speakers if they would like to comment at this point on what Howard has told us, Deborah. I really like the concept of the village elder 
the combination of expertise in the field and the uh, trust and respect. Those of us who mediate know that building trust among the parties is absolutely essential to uh, decision. But I particularly appreciate the monitoring of the health of the relationships because it's, it's being able to track the party's ability to work together over time that is so essential. Thank you, Deborah. Anyone else? Going on, Diego? I just wanted to ask Howard how translatable he felt this way of resolving, oop, preventing, sorry, yes. Alex, disputes um, was to other industries. And I'll yeah. tell you uh, my biases, probably, yes. I, I have an expertise in the life sciences, and what you said was very important. There are long-term ongoing relationships kind of too big to fail, right? Yes, so, yes. Right? But uh, I just wanted to hear what you thought about that. And, and if you've had I, conversations with anybody about the, the oh, yes. portability of this to other industries. Yeah, well, at CPR, and, and I've been... Um, I have had the, the benefits and the pleasure of participating in CPR committees, discussions with our colleagues, sharing ideas. I think the basic principles of the Intel program, as I call it, are entirely translatable and transplantable into other business contexts. Because that, that basic context of having that mutually respected um, neutral, that village elder in that community, let's say that community is a, an effort to put together a joint venture between two big pharmas. Uh, a, from what I've heard from those involved in those, those are fraught with uh, risk, fraught with disputes. And I've imagined in that context, having someone mutually selected by those two joint ventures, someone who has been through the mill of doing this, failing, trying, who's seen it all. And they, they both respect this person and therefore select that person. And then they give that person an array of tools to use to resolve at the earliest possible point those disputes which are not prevented. Place that person in the middle of the relationship, have a senior management team, just as we do on these projects, meet on a regular basis with that village elder who can observe and report on the same two issues, risk, what risks are, are on the horizon? And this is an elder who has seen the risks and lived them. And then um, not just on the horizon, but which ones are now coming to life and haven't been addressed by the two organizations. And that's a common experience. You know, People involved in endeavor for any number of reasons may be avoiding managing or dealing with that risk. They don't want to face it. It's a 600 pound elephant in the room. Right. And they just assume that it's sit in the closet and not come out. Right. What our TPNs will gently and diplomatically do is say at the monthly senior management meetings, excuse me, but I think there's a 600 pound elephant in this room. And it would be incumbent upon all of us to really bring the elephant out of the corner and look it squarely in the eyes. It's only the village elder who can really do that. And so, yes, I see this as eminently transplantable into other business contexts. I just wanted to make, a, uh, as I was sitting here listening to you, uh, it, sometimes in pharma uh, or other diagnostic uh, medical device collaborations, mm -hmm. there's an added issue of the collaborators being absolute fierce competitors. Mm -hmm. Uh, which is a little, adds a little frisson to the party, yes? Um, and there are also very significant legal compliance issues with what yeah. can and can't be done. So what I'm sitting here thinking about is, 
and I apologize for this, maybe sort of co-village elders in a situation like that might be helpful. Someone who's really just focused on project management and business and also uh, a lawyer who can help with Absolutely. antitrust issues, compliance issues, but who's also a business lawyer. So that's an excellent point. Excellent yeah. point. Because the village elder need not be a single person. Right. You could have a panel, you could have a team. A bunch of old and people. <laughs> you're going to have a bunch of, thank you. Um, and one is, uh, and, and so you look at, at, you know, I color my hair. Okay. This is, <laughs> I can qualify. <laughs> uh, I, maybe I should, I don't know. Uh, but uh, where the venture has complex regulatory issues, legal issues, then perhaps you add a talent to that standing neutral. And that can be done either by having a multi-member panel or mm -hmm. by having a lead member, the, the elder, if you will, who then brings on subject matter experts to assist it in the performance of its role. That's what we do. Oh, okay. That's good. Yeah. So our, our, our village elder is first and foremost, a construction professional. They're the general contractor. <laughs> they right? could, they have, they're, they're, they're construction <laughs> managers, they're claims consultants, even who've been in the business for 40 years who've been in the, in the role of, of taking over projects that are in default and then completing them. Uh, so they've been in, you know, they've, they've been on the front lines. They know what it's like to sit in a job trailer, to talk to project managers, to talk to superintendents. Mm -hmm. They've got that credibility and that experience. But under our contract uh, and the, the kind of the, the program, the TPN has the authority to engage the services of subject matter experts to assist it. Those subject matter experts might be a scheduling expert. They might be a, a cost estimator, or they might be a neutral lawyer. So where the issue that, they, that, that is in front of everyone is one purely of contract interpretation. Maybe there's some some provision in the contract that um, the parties are fundamentally disagreeing on. And the TP end is, you know, by education trading, uh, you know, a, an engineer turned construction manager. Well, they'll go out and select a, they can go out and select a, a neutral lawyer mm -hmm. to give them advice. And we are actually doing right now, one of our TPNs is providing an informal advisory opinion on a technical issue mm -hmm. that she, um, it, it's, it's beyond her expertise. It's so very highly technical. So she has selected a subject matter expert, an expert in that particular field to assist her in the study investigation and then providing an advisory opinion on this particular dispute. Great, thank you. Yep. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Howard. Uh, now turning to Deborah. Uh, Deborah, in your experience, uh, would you have uh, some examples or concrete situations in which dispute prevention techniques have been successfully implemented or in which uh, those techniques could have been implemented? I've got an example of one in which uh, those techniques were implemented and could have been improved by some of what uh, CPR has developed and what Howard has been implementing. And one situation where they weren't implemented and, and uh, to, to, to no, no good end. Um, mm -hmm. in, uh, before the corporate executive and director roles that ultimately led me to my current uh, independent ADR practice, I too was a deal lawyer. All I did was negotiate transactions for about 22 years in a top 100 US law firm. And CPR's focus on dispute prevention based on that background is one of the things that really uh, has attracted me to CPR and caused me to put so much energy uh, into this. And as I've thought about dispute prevention, one particular deal from my uh, long ago law practice comes to mind. 
uh, it is in the life science space, but it's also in the supply chain space, an issue mm -hmm. that's near and dear to many of our hearts. Very often we look at joint ventures as a logical place for dispute prevention. And it is because of the total mutual dependency. But this particular supply arrangement was a critical mutual dependency. A global pharma company who had developed the only treatment for an infectious disease that was ravaging a significant portion of the population, mm. built a facility to produce that product. Only place in the world approved to produce that product. Lots of other products were being produced on the rest of the campus such that this particular man total manufacturing facility represented in today's dollars, a billion and a half dollars of revenue to the organization. Pharma company decides they're gonna sell this facility. The buyer that emerged through the process that we ran was a newly formed contract manufacturing company. They drew together funding, technical expertise, but in a situation like that, there's no track record. So you've got this critical, highly publicized or highly uh, visible supply issue coupled with the absence of a track record. The, transac the transaction documents implemented the best of these methods alliance managers, internal managers, ability to raise additional disputes. We put in, with the blessing of the Wall Street lenders for this new co, a provision that if the products went out of spec, uh, my client, the pharma company, could come in and take control of the facility and actually run it. Because default provisions don't help if you can't mm -hmm. get products, right? So sure enough, over time, there was an issue as to compliance. And the issue worked its way up the chain. And days before uh, we were about to go in and take over the facility and run it, the parties finally achieved a remediation plan to get the products back into compliance. Now, I look back at that and I think it is, it does demonstrate how a lot of mm -hmm. these techniques that are out there in various ways can be very successful. There were two things that I think might've made a difference in the way Intel and CPR approach dispute prevention. One is that of culture and commitment. Yeah. I think the parties approached this issue over compliance with a sense of mutually assured destruction. It was as if the <laughs> nuclear powers were, ne were negotiating. I can hurt you more, right? Now, obviously my client would have remained standing, but they would have had significant reputational as well as revenue yeah. loss. Uh, so the culture of we're in this together, even though we're contractual, I think would have informed a different mindset. Of course, the other thing I think would have made a significant difference would have been to have a third party neutral. How much expertise in manufacturing was needed is an issue that we would have worked through at the time, mm -hmm. the ability to source that, but somebody reminding the parties of their mutual codependency, mutual benefit rather than mutual destruction, I think could have helped it. The other issue was this monitoring, and Howard, this is why I seized on it so much, the constant monitoring of the health of the mm -hmm. relationships. What's going on on the day-to-day -day basis? Are the parties really listening to each other, or are mm -hmm. they just trying to prove their point? Are they just trying to win in all the little conversations that go on? Yeah. So I think that's where that ultimately successful process and project could have been enhanced with some of the techniques that we've developed. Mm -hmm. Let me turn to a couple of situations in which uh, dispute prevention was not adopted to, I suspect, no good in. I say mm -hmm. suspect because in one of the two cases, I don't really know what happened. Both of these involve conflict in corporate governance systems. The first one was between a founder CEO and his board slash investors. 
that founder CEO called up a former law partner of mine, an outstanding litigator advocate, and described the situation. That law partner, a former law partner, friend of mine said, you don't need to lawyer up with somebody like me. Call somebody like Deborah, who gets corporate governance, who understands the workings between investors and management, between the board and management. Get someone, get Deborah or someone like her mm -hmm. to help you work through these issues. Neither one of us ever heard from him again. <laughs> More recently, <laughs> I had an engagement with a nonprofit here in my community of Durham, North Carolina, small nonprofit, but doing some really important work in some really important areas. They had some issues in management that led to a major change in structure and left them with a deadlocked board. This board was trying to decide how to move the organization forward how to identify their issues that had led to the need for the house cleaning and move forward. It took so long for them to agree on the engagement that by the time I was able to get in and get started, it was apparent nothing could be done to save yeah. this marriage. There was a war being waged on email between the two directors mm -hmm. most opposed. Fortunately, their council was able to get those two directors to resign to be able to move forward. But when we think about the cost to organizations of major disagreements within the corporate umbrella of owners, investors, board, management, and the disruption that that causes in the execution of the purpose of the organization, it's apparent that listening to counsel like this uh, one who reached out to me and the one who tried on the first uh, situation can really move the purpose forward. Thank you, Raphael and all. Thank you, Deborah. And any comments from the other speakers? Uh, just one. Um, I think a point that comes out of Deborah's comments, Deborah's stories, is this. Um, I call it the rules of engagement, meaning this. If you step into the ring on a boxing match and you start throwing punches, that's you're, it's too late for the referee to step in and announce the rules for the fight. You're already, you're already fighting. It's essential that the rules, and this is process, the program, the rules, the system be set up and in place before the people step into the ring. If the ring is going to be defined as that, that board meeting for the first time on the nonprofit, as the joint ventures starting to actually perform via the contract, the stage has to have already been set in that contract for the mechanisms for dispute prevention. Lessons learned. The earlier, the better. That's right, for our. And any other thoughts or comments? Should we move on to Diego, Alan? Yes, it, it, you know, I, I think that um, the concept of lessons learned is critical for all of us. But too mm -hmm. often, we're thinking about dispute prevention in retrospect. Wish we would have. Mm -hmm. Diego, I know you've been in involved in helping design systems for dispute prevention, for how to better uh, keep us out of value depleting conflict. And I know you've been involved in several initiatives in Brazil in the past 15 years, designing these kinds of programs. Can you share with us your experience in dispute system design? and the things you've learned from those experiences? Yes, uh, thank you, Alan. Thank you, Rafael, for this kind invitation. It's, it's a great pleasure to be here with Howard, with Deborah, and, and Connie. It's, uh, it's amazing to, to, to share uh, experiences here in this uh, topic. Um, well, I guess uh, everything we, we say has something in common. 
I think it's the idea of uh, identifying barriers uh, to effective negotiation and, and working to reduce them uh, in advance of disputes. Um, as you know, as you mentioned, uh, Ellen, we, we all learn looking in retrospect, but the, the, the thing is, I think there are three critical points that we, we need to uh, be mindful. One, one is, are the root causes of, of disputes. Um, often we learn them late, but we have to be quick in identifying them and, and dealing with them. And there are a number of examples uh, of cases. And even where dispute resolution systems help you identify the real problems uh, that parties have um, when, when they litigate. Uh, but, the, but I guess there are two other elements um, which I think are important. One is, uh, is working on relationship, in enhancing relationship. And, and, and the other one is, is early intervention, which I think has everything to do with uh, what we, we're talking about. Um, but for, for these two uh, items, uh, there's one key word, which is trust. Um, and, and, and you have lots of research that when, when parties trust each other, they're more open to the other's uh, perspectives and, and, and and, and, and you really, uh, and, and, and mechanisms of uh, dispute prevention work much better. Um, so th that's, that, that's a, a very big word, uh, trust, how, how do you, and I think the real point is, how do you have a, a, a practical uh, application, you know, how in practice can you build trust? And you know, one of the things that gave me insight is, uh, I used to, and Rafael did that as well, we, we used to be coaches for, negotiation teams uh, in those competitions like CPR. Um, and, and one of the things I thought is, okay, I have one, uh, one hour and a half session. Uh, my team doesn't know the other side. We have to build trust in one hour and a half with someone you never saw. Um, and what are you supposed to do? How do you do that? And, and I, I, I have a simple word for that impeccability. <laughs> I, I, I talked to uh, Professor Bondell from Pepperdine. She had an, uh, uh, she designed a system somewhere else and she, she uses the same strategy and she calls it pristinity. <laughs> um, so if you're facing someone you never met and we're all like analyzing each other, like uh, reading each other all the time. If you spend an hour and a half with a person and you have no, nothing to comment, you know, if you, because um, I think, Howard, that I have the opposite problem than you. Uh, I, I, we don't have the, in the cases I work on, I don't, we don't have the elder of the tribe. We, we have a lot of young people <laughs> that need to, we, we have thousands of cases that we have to deal with. And, and there are not so many elders, so we need to train people. So uh, this idea, you know, of, of doing the right thing and, and, and just, doing striving for for you know being impeccable being uh you know active listening considering the problems being transparent being being uh upfront about the issues and the problems that you have to resolve and i know I'll just give you examples i've worked in uh aircraft accidents i've worked with uh dam breaks and this very 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 uh, uh tough situations where emotions are heightened, where the levels of distress, distress are really high. And, and we have to build, the, the whole thing is, is to build a strategy of early intervention that people can trust. Uh, so one example, recent example I'm working on in, in this uh, subsidence case, it's um, homes are sinking in, I think it's 6% of an entire city. We're talking about 17, mm -hmm thousand homes, 85,000 people from slums to mm. higher class condos, uh, soccer teams, hospitals, cemeteries. <laughs> we are relocating like 6% of the city. And, and in the beginning, the strategy was, was to really build something people could trust. So we built, uh, we, 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 okay, we need, to, we need to talk to people. So we built, uh, I think it was, uh, around 80 meeting rooms mm -hmm. <laughs> in, uh, in two weeks, like, you know, like this Chinese hospital 
COVID building strategies. Like in two weeks, we build like a complex for dispute resolution with round tables, plants, all the decoration, you know, to make it a, you know, a nice environment. We train teams, we use facilitators, uh, we, we interview people, we ask them, we let them vent, we understand, we, we were very upfront about all the issues, all the process, and we were explaining them. We had um, arrangement, like settlements with, with the public authorities about uh, you know, uh, compensation criteria, because we needed to relocate people. So we needed to be quick because mm -hmm. people were in danger. Um, and then we needed to compensate. And people don't want to leave their homes if you don't compensate. So we have all sorts of trust challenges. Um, just one, one thing that was one case where we relocated the family on a Friday and there was a rain. And on, Sunday, on Saturday, their home went down. So it was like uh, this kind of situations that we were dealing with high stress, but we built this system and 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 we explained and, and and it was and there's one thing about one different about dealing with crisis in Brazil and probably in the United States. In the United States, what we see you probably can explain better for us. The government actually help you in the first moment, then they will fine you, they will charge you billions of dollars, but in the, in the first moment they will come in and they'll help you. Here is quite different because the government, they don't want to attach to this company that done something wrong. And, and, and so they don't, they, wanna, they don't want to attach their image. So they're, they're finger pointing. Um, so we were really uh, in this uh, sessions with, with government officials and, and they were saying this, these people are not doing the right thing. They're doing this. And at some point, uh, families came up and said, no, 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 I like what they're saying. If, 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 they, if they do what they're saying, and it seems that like they'll do it, we're fine. And in a few, like less than one month, we closed the deal with, with government, mm -hmm. legitimizing the, 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 the whole strategy, making it even more uh, trustworthy. So. It's about uh, building trust. It's about uh, uh, um, working practically in, in the details, yeah. striving to do the right thing. So that, that that's kind of, uh, I guess, one of the well, the, the main message uh, I like to pass on. And this this thing, uh, you know, uh, about the elder of the tribe. Uh, I, I I have to work in a different context. I think technique, you know, being highly technical, doing the right things. Checking all the boxes uh, works very well. Training people to uh, we uh, we have a hundred facilitators working in this project. We, we do around I don't know eight hundred uh, settlements per month. It, it's like a machine, efficient machine of of settling cases, and and we uh, we tr simply train people. So yeah. and I think we, we we need to think about this for the next generation. Mm -hmm. So those are my, my I'm so struck. I, I, I'm so struck by how, even when facing a public crisis like you're talking about, where you're dealing with thousands of people who have been injured or have claims, it comes back to the same thing. It comes back to you and me having a relationship. Are mm -hmm. you going to do what you say you're going to do? And and building that trust, whether you're dealing with thousands of people or one on one. Uh, in these uh, business relationships and otherwise, uh, Diego, that's a, that's a powerful observation. Okay, does anybody have any other uh, comments uh, for Diego or questions? Well, here, here's, a, here's a comment, something in common, um, something that, that struck me, Diego, from your comments. In effect, there's a significant, what I'd call governance element to the programs that you have designed. You set up the mechanisms, the means, the meeting rooms, the, the facilities, you set up the, the forums by which trust can be exhibited and built. Um, you're not leaving trust 
to simply the good intentions of individuals working as individuals, you give given structure to how trust is actually performed. That's what we do. We, we do it strictly at a senior management level of the primary participants. But there is a senior management risk committee that meets once a month with the standing neutral. That's a governance piece for the project. And it's within that, that forum, if you will, that trust is built. And what we've seen, as a matter of fact, is that this senior management team, and this is a team composed of representatives of Intel, of the constructor, of the design professional at a very senior management level. When they're working together, by the time this project is done, they are a collaborating machine. They are a team and they function as a cross organizational team. And the more problems they solve together, the more they build as a team. And the neutral is the, the center point for that team. They're the coach for the team. Yeah, Howard, we, we have a, we use scripts. You know, we, 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 we have what we call like a framing committee in each mm -hmm. project where yeah. we frame all the messages and we just use them all over. So if there is a, an issue, there's a tax issue that we didn't foresee, we have to explain the tax issue and ask so we build a frame Yep. And we let it out. So, and then we learn from, is the frame working? Is it not? How we correct it? So we, we have frames for virtually every possible situation. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, you know, strategy, like you, you, you foresee the possible junctures and you have a line of action uh, for all right. of them. And you have established <laughs> mechanisms. That's, I, I, again, I think, one of the foundations of dispute management are is structure and mechanisms. Mm -hmm. In the words of that great dispute manager, Ronald Reagan, trust but verify, is that? Uh... <laughs> um, all right, Rafael, let me, uh, let me hand it back to you. Now I'll turn into Kona, our, our last speaker, Kona. I'll, I'll use my New York speed. <laughs> um, well, I mean, I, it's been so rich, everything that I've heard, uh, and uh, I could spend a lot of time just commenting on what other folks have said, but um, I'll just sort of run through some of the points I wanted to make and uh, see if anybody has anything uh, to add. Uh, I'm sure words of wisdom will come as a result of uh, hearing what I have to say and, 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 and thinking about it. And I look forward to that. So I am a former litigator. I was a litigator at a firm called Paul Weiss in New York and um, learned lots about litigation there, including the fact that it, it tended to be a dispute extender, not a dispute resolver. And I went in house to uh, the life sciences companies, such as pharmaceutical, medical device, diagnostics, et cetera, most notably, Novartis. I'm really going to date myself now. I started out at Sibagaygi and they merged with Sandoz to become Novartis. And Alan, I also uh, did some work uh, for Azi. He always likes me to mention that. <laughs> that was when Alan was there as the general counsel and um, biotech and uh, Mylan uh, on the generic side. So I've sort of been around uh, the industry. And I, I then I became a uh, uh, neutral uh, mediator and arbitrator, I would say my practices split pretty evenly. So I'm going to make four points, two relating to my experience as an insight counsel, where I too was forced to become a transactional lawyer over 20 years. Um, I committed to uh, malpractice for about two years. Uh, as a litigator, they threw me into these uh, transactions, but I eventually learned a little bit about what I was doing. Um, and uh, then uh, I'll make a couple of comments about dispute prevention from my vantage point as a neutral. So the first point I would like to make is to wholeheartedly uh, endorse what Howard said, which is you have to go into negotiating any collaboration, assuming that there will be disputes. And I like to 
talk about the dispute management lens or the dispute risk management perspective. You must bring that business person or lawyer to every contract you negotiate. And I think uh, one point that, that hasn't been made, but I'm, I'm sure there will be no disagreement with this, is that it really starts with negotiating the contract and taking the time to make sure that you have clear provisions. As you know, flipping over to my uh, status as a mediator and an arbitrator, I rarely see a terrific contract that comes to me. You know, there's something wrong with it, <laughs> right? And uh, a lot of the time it's been, uh, let's face it, I, I saw this all the time, business development people are incentivized to complete deals and they get bonuses based upon how many deals they do. So there's always a tug of war between the business people and the legal department about how much time to spend writing things down. I, all, I was a general counsel in Europe and you know, be, simply because they don't have as much litigation there, uh, their contracts are much thinner than uh, in the, uh, an American context where we often end up in court. So everything needs to be written down, especially if New York is the governing law. So really yeah. there is, uh, a, 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 I, uh, really when I talk about this sort of stuff, I stress, Start with what the contract says and don't shove it in a drawer when the contract is done. There's a fantastic article written by a gentleman named Danny Ertel, um, which I periodically uh, read. It's in the Harvard um, Business Review. I think you can get it on the internet called um, Getting Past Yes, colon, Negotiating as Though Implementation Matters. And I tell you, if you did the things that mm -hmm. he recommends, um, making sure the other side actually can do what they can do. It's a pair of victory if you get them to agree to do something that they don't have the capacity. Encourage mm -hmm. them to do the internal due diligence and you have as the negotiating party an obligation to your client to make sure that you know, they can do it, right? A representation of warranty is not as good as them actually being able to build the plant, right, Howard? So um, all of that, you could go on and on about good negotiating practices, preparing, um, et cetera. Uh, another thing, uh, lessons learned, I think is very important is uh, as inside counsel or as people doing deals regularly, you should do an audit of the disputes that have come up. And when mm -hmm. I say disputes, I don't just mean legal disputes. I say it's very worthwhile going back over the past 10 years and asking the question, what issues have taken a lot of senior management time? Right? Not just what ended up in litigation or in mediation, but right. what took a lot of senior management time? Where do we go south? And that can help you avoid problems uh, in the future. Um, in terms of mechanisms that I worked with as a former lawyer uh, to help prevent disputes from arising, uh, the pharmaceutical industry was quite uh, ahead of the curve in terms of developing the concept of alliance management. Uh, there is an organization called ASAP, <laughs> uh, the Association of Strategic Alliance Professionals. This is a profession that has grown up um, in life sciences, but also in big IT uh, collaborations, mm -hmm. building software, et cetera, et cetera. And these folks are neutral, not neutral parties. They are employees of all of the uh, collaboration members, but they are designed, they are supposed to work together to help surface issues, to mm -hmm. run those committees that Howard was talking about. Uh, and uh, there was a time in, in pharma collaborations when there were, com it got a little out of control, the number of committees <laughs> there were. And there were, at my old law firm, there was a committee on committees. We almost got to that. <laughs> right? So you have to get the committees uh, in control, but um, it helps. I mean, you know, all, I totally agree with what Howard said. It's about mechanisms, building them in, recognizing that there will be disputes, especially from my vantage point as um, a manager of collaborations among the competitors, right? Uh, so, that, that, that's a problem. So alliance management is an incredibly important uh, tool. All of the committees, I focused, those sort of fall into the category of self-help. Really, I think of an important part of dispute prevention is focusing on all of the things you can do by way of self-help without hiring, mm -hmm. hiring lawyers or without hiring a neutral. There are a lot of things that you can do that work um, it, before bringing third parties in. And in pharma and medical devices, you know, the, there's a real problem with confidentiality. People are very reluctant mm -hmm. 
to bring in outside parties and share their patents and their secret mm -hmm. sauce and how they do things. There's just this, and I understand that it's, it verges on paranoia <laughs> at, po at some points, but you have to accept that. And, and really, I think self-help helps with that. Now, mm -hmm. going on into my uh, vantage point as uh, a neutral, the, the points three and four are, uh, I just want to make everyone aware that there is something that people talk about, but it's not often done, but I've had the ability to do it, which is deal me mediation. Uh, deal mediation or uh, deal facilitation. Um, I'll give you an example. Uh, two parties uh, had a huge dispute about a, a dis distribution agreement and it involved patent disputes uh, and uh, they settled the, the litigation, but they said if a patent issued, then they would hire a facilitator to help them negotiate a patent license agreement because they had been, they hated each other. Now, so they realized that they <laughs> might need some help when it came to um, mm -hmm. negotiating a patent license. And so they brought me in and I accept facilitation on the contract, but I said, let's do mediation because then we'll have the protection of all of the mediation privileges and all of that. Um, but I was using my skills as a mediator and I set up meetings between the patent lawyers for hours. We discussed, you know, obviousness for the patents challengeable, et cetera, et cetera. Very, very deep in the weeds stuff. And that conversation I helped manage. Um, I even got the outside man, uh, patent opinion from one side, which I didn't share with the other side, but I had it so I could direct traffic. And then we talked about business solutions and, and, to, to the license, et cetera. And they negotiate that we came up with a term sheet and they negotiated the deal. I mean, that is dispute prevention because mm -hmm. you're bringing in a third party to help you formulate the contract. And something I said constantly when we were doing the term sheet was, if you don't deal with this issue, it's going to cause a dispute from my vantage point as someone who had been around uh, the block on these things. And then bleeding into that, you know, we talk about mediation sometimes being more in connection with legal disputes. Early mediation, uh, people come to me uh, quite a bit before an arbitration or litigation is filed because as you said, Howard, you know, I've just been around the block and I do color my hair. So maybe I am <laughs> in some way. So, um, <laughs> They, it, uh, what ends up happening in these early mediations is first of all, you have to do a lot of information exchange, but you end up rewriting the contract really mm -hmm. because it's not working. It, uh, it, 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 the, the delivery schedule was too aggressive under the circumstances or um, there was a stability issue as Deborah said, I had one of those. And what do you, it's not, it's nobody's fault, right? I spent a lot of time in those situations saying, just because there was a technical failure doesn't mean there was anybody's fault. There wasn't the F word, fraud, right? You know, it wasn't the F word. It wasn't the N word, negligence. It, it wasn't any of those things. Yeah. It's just that in our research development and commercialization world, sometimes it's hard. That's the miracle of um, pharmaceutical uh, and uh, device and diagnostics experimentation. It's hard. And many, many products failed. It's nobody's fault. So I spent a lot of time taking fault out of the picture and helping people rebuild their relationships and, and redo their contracts or coming up with a solution that keeps them out of court. And that, that too can really has a lot of the hallmarks are dispute prevention. Mm -hmm. And one, you know, a final point I'd make about skill sets is I took a course in something called facilitation with what used to be called the Public Conversation Project. And now it's called the Central Partners. Fabulous organization. They, what they do is they structure conversations. They structure what they call dialogues um, in communities that are at loggerheads. And they're not really uh, about uh, resolving a dispute or coming up with an agreement. It's just getting people to listen to each other better. And I use those techniques that I learned in the course of some mediations. I talk to each party, per, each participant in the conflict individually to get a sense of what they think is an issue. I structure conversations. We spend a lot of time in joint sessions in, in some of my early mediations, just getting people to talk to each other. And as you said, Howard, when people are absolutely forced to talk to each other, even though they think they hate each other, uh, it really, you know, there's natural sense of politeness and decorum come into play or, you know, what's generally considered acceptable behavior. Mm -hmm. um, and there's always outliers on that point. <laughs> but uh, 
it, it helps. So early mediation often has the feel of some of the dispute prevention um, mechanisms because yeah. you're using facilitation mechanisms. You're not necessarily going to come up with a solution to a legal dispute because you're very early uh, in the process, right? So yes. it, it's sort of a sick collaboration and you're trying to get people to work better together that they have not sued each other yet, yay, right? And I also spend a lot of time telling people once you cross over that line and you hand it over to, I wouldn't say lawyers, Howard, so much as litigators. I used to be one, okay? <laughs> you, you can just, it just, and no offense, but it just, um, litigators have a role and a place absolutely yeah. but that role and place is not necessarily business problem solving it's who is right and wrong it's in that world when you need a lawyer and a litigator you need a very good aggressive litigator and like i said it has its place but just be careful about way when you hand it over to when you cross that line because it will only at least in the um, in the short run or even the medium run, exacerbate conflict um, in, in my experience. So those are my points. Negotiate the contract well, as though implementation mattered, take the time, focus on alliance management and other self-help tools like committee structures, although you really should avoid committees on committees. Um, then as a neutral, you know, think about involving a neutral in the negotiation of the agreement itself, especially if there's stress that definitely requ requires an industry expert, and then really focus on early mediation uh, using dispute prevention mechanisms and techniques arising out of facilitation to help structure um, difficult conversations. Thank you. Thank you, Kona. I understand that Deborah has to leave. Deborah, thank you for your participation. It has been a pleasure. Let me ask just Diego and Howard if they would like to comment on Kona's sure. uh, account. Uh, yes, I, actually. Uh, there were two, two items she touched on which resonate because I see them, uh, they are a part of our program. One, um, her comments on early mediation. And that is, if you would watch our TPNs when they put on a facilitator hat, it would, Frankly, what it would look like, and I've said this before, it would look like a small claims mediation mm. that maybe we did in training 30 or 40 years ago, <laughs> right? Where yeah. I've seen them and I've heard these stories. They will sit, two pro, the project manager from Intel and their counterpart with the constructor, they have a disagreement. They sit around a table with the neutral, with our TPN. So there's no lawyers there. There's no position statements. They talk about their views on this particular issue they're hung up on. And then they ask the neutral, what do you think about this? And they have this open discussion where now you're neutral acting in a both a, a facilitative role and an evaluative role in an open session is talking to these two decision makers. And the result is they find agreement. It is the most classic fundamental definition of mediation that you can think of. And we see it performed by them. They, it's so, there's an effortless slide from that of being the, the, the coach mentor to being that facilitator slash mediator. And, and, that, and that's, that's what they do. Though, that's really helpful though, because they've been involved all the way along. Exactly, they, they know. know. They already know. They know. Yes, right. So, the, and the second feature is confidentiality, and that we cloak by contract the 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 role, the functions, the communications of the TPN in confidentiality. So, whatever is communicated to the TPN, whether it's in a meeting, whether it's in a writing, is confidential. It cannot be used in a later dispute resolution, binding dispute resolution proceeding. That of course gives the members of the senior management risk committee, the freedom to put stuff on the table and to talk to the neutral, to talk to the TPN. It gives the TPN the freedom to offer their unvarnished views at times on project risk. And the parties know, well, that's not gonna, those, those, the minutes of that meeting are not gonna show up as an exhibit later 
in a triple A arbitration or a CPR arbitration or a binding arbitration or litigation. You've got to give the parties the protection of confidentiality if there's going to be a free exchange and the building of trust that comes from a free exchange of, of thoughts, communications, discussions, etc. Yep. Interesting. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Howard. Any comments, Diego? Just a quick one. I, I, I've, I've seen something in Brazil that was quite unusual. Uh, a mediation, the two companies, they had a, a long-standing contract and they, they had a mediate, I mean, they had uh, a period that would, they would negotiate the, 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 re renew, the renovation of the contract. Um, if they didn't come to terms, they would use a mediator. Um, and mm -hmm. if, if the mediator's mediation was un unsuccessful, they will keep the former clauses. So it's uh, a device mm -hmm. to, uh, oh. so I have just sent my, my proposal. I don't know if, if it will be uh, accepted uh, yet. Uh -huh. but I, I thought it, it was something very, very different. I don't know how far I've ever seen a case like this in Brazil. So it's very, very, very exciting. Very interesting. Very. Two, two foreign companies uh, operating in Brazil with their Brazilian subsidiaries, but very interesting. <laughs> very, uh, I, very cool. I'd love to keep on discussing. You know, this is a fantastic topic. We could go on for hours, but unfortunately, our time is up and uh, we need to conclude our webinar. I'll, I'll pass on to Alan for his uh, closing remarks. From my side, and from MAMG Advogados, I would like to again express our gratitude to all the speakers and attendees. It has been a wonderful session. I learned a lot and I'm sure uh, looking forward to implement everything I learned here in my work as, as a counsel for clients and also as a neutral. Alan, for your closing remarks. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rafael and, and MAMG and, and all of our panelists. You, you could just sense the energy and passion and enthusiasm brought by these wonderful leaders in the area to this really critical issue of dispute prevention. And to borrow the title from the article that Kana referred to in the Harvard Business Journal, let's put dispute prevention into implementation. Let's really find ways to take mm -hmm. these concepts, which I think all translate into such tremendous value for all the parties. There don't have to be winners and losers when it comes to dispute prevention, only winners. And let's find ways to implement this through the kinds of things that Diego, Howard, Kana, and Deborah have been doing and really looking out to the audience. Uh, please engage with us at CPR and engage in this area of dispute prevention. We'd love to have you around the table as we really try to put these things in practice. So thank you all. You, you've stayed beyond time, which is I think a testament <laughs> to how, uh, how engaged everybody is on this issue. And again, MAMG and Raphael, great leadership. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.